Hello, I'm NC513 and this is a Commodore 64 repair story. Hmm, look at that! What sort of animal is this? Well, this is in fact a 1985 model 250425 Commodore 64 motherboard that I've just finished installing a total of 23 IC sockets on. A gentleman JT asked me to take a look at this board as it stubbornly just would refuse to power on properly. He said it would just give him a black screen and that it might have been killed by a bad power supply with over voltage on the 5 volt DC line. As far as I could tell, the power switch and the power in female connector on the PCB appeared to be in okay condition. I was thinking that, well, it's probably just something typical like the PLA. Vic. Or DRAM. Here's the power supply JT was talking about. Let's see what sort of readings we get. We have 10.09 uh, volts AC on pin 6 and 7, which is fine. Careful, you really don't want to slip here. Well, between pins 5 and 2 we have uh, 5.46 volts DC, which definitely is too high. About 5.2 volts would still be okay. So, let's take a known good power supply and see what happens now that I've put all the original chips back on JT's board. Earlier I also checked some voltages and frequencies in a number of different spots on the board, but didn't find anything suspicious. The reset line seemed to behave just fine and no chips were considerably warmer or cooler than expected. I also tried booting with a so-called uh, dead test cartridge, but the screen just stayed black, just like it's doing now. Also the tape drive's capstan motor didn't stop spinning until I switched the power off. This, the U2 CIA, is the 26th chip I pulled from this board. I'll remove it again now. As I wasn't quite sure what to do with this board, I figured I might as well start desoldering some chips and test them one by one. Out of the first 25 chips I moved from this board to another working board, all except the SID simply passed all diagnostics tests with flying colors. And the SID isn't really relevant at this point. Unless you have a proper IC puller tool, which I don't, you need to work extremely slowly and carefully when pulling chips out of sockets. The worst thing you can do is to go, hey look, it's almost loose, I'll just rip it out with my fingers now. Bad idea. Okay, position U2 is now empty, so let's see what happens. Yes, there's our blue basic screen. Looks promising, but you never know. So, uh, so I'll spend the rest of this video doing a bunch of tests. I'll mark this chip as defective. 
replacement CIAs are becoming rarer, but luckily the situation isn't that bad. Let's try this one. I'll also install a diagnostics harness and cartridge. One of the first chips I desoldered was the U1 CIA, but for some reason I left its neighbor U2, the second CIA, untouched. I guess I was under the impression that a bad U2 usually just causes problems with serial and user port access, instead of actually preventing the computer from booting properly. Anyway, after finally desoldering the U2 CIA, I noticed that it indeed did make my perfect condition test board display nothing but a black screen. So, fingers crossed, we finally hit the bullseye. Now, let's see. Zero page OK, stack page OK, screen RAM OK, RAM test 1, OK, RAM test 2, OK, PLA test OK, color RAM OK, kernel ROM, basic ROM, character ROM, OK, cassette, OK, keyboard, OK, control port, bad, U18, bad, serial port, OK, user port, OK, timer 1, OK, timer 2, OK, interrupts, OK. So control port, bad, U18, bad. Well, even though it says control port, bad, I would expect joysticks to work just fine. There might, however, be a problem with using paddles or a mouse. And the reason is probably a faulty U18 SID. Yes, the SID is a sound chip, but it also has some other duties. The sound test didn't sound too bad, but unfortunately I'm suspecting that the filters of this SID chip aren't working properly. We'll try to play some music in a while. In the meantime, let's remove and mark this presumably damaged SID chip. Let's see if we can make the control port complaints go away if we install a different SID. The sound test is going to sound ridiculous as also this SID is faulty, but the mouse and pedals inputs should work. Control port OK, so the earlier complaints were probably due to the paddle inputs on JT's SID being faulty. Now we don't need the harness anymore. I'll also remove my own broken SID and install JT's SID on the board again.
Let's also hook up some joysticks, a tape drive and JT's keyboard. And power on. What the? Oh, maybe this would help. The keyboard seems to work. Yep, all keys work, including the run-stop-restore combination. Now I'll install the 1541 Ultimate 2 cartridge, which among other things is a floppy drive emulator. Let's load something through the cartridge port, and let's listen carefully without all the background noise. That speech part was way too quiet. Here there should be a heavily filtered instrument playing a lead melody, but it's almost completely inaudible. There's no doubt that this SID has damaged filters. Okay, let's go old school for real and try a turbo tape. Yep, seems to work. Whoops. Oh well. How about device number 8, the floppy drive, or in this case the floppy emulator?
Very nice. And finally, let's just test both joysticks real quick. Well, I'd say that this board appears to be working just great now, but JT might want to buy a replacement SID because, as it is, some tunes just won't sound right, and paddles or a mouse probably wouldn't work either. My strategy might not have been the best, but still this was lots of fun. It's always good to get a bit of desoldering and soldering practice. However, next time I probably won't remove just the SID, but also both CIAs before I start testing anything else. Until next time, bye.